Hello, uh, I'm Roger Ganim, and I am the Assistant Vice President of Legal Affairs for Liberty Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with uh, the uh, administrators and faculty and, and students of South Florida Bible College, along with the other Christian leaders who have uh, joined us for this conference. Um, I have been a, an attorney for just over 20 years now, uh, the first 15 or so in Jacksonville as a commercial uh, business litigator. And then the last six years, I've worked full-time for Liberty Council, doing uh, religious liberty work uh, full-time. And uh, it has been a real uh, privilege and an honor to work for Liberty Council. Uh, we are a, uh, an organization uh, committed to the sanctity of life, uh, religious liberty, and the family. And uh, we do litigation, uh, education, public policy work uh, around the country. And uh, we have uh, attorneys in several states, as well as affiliate attorneys, uh, who help us out uh, around uh, around the world, and so I wanted to uh, today talk about uh, a couple of recent Supreme Court decisions that deal with uh, federal non discrimination law. The Liberty Council, uh, we are an international nonprofit uh, litigation, education, and public policy organization, and you've heard of some of our uh, some of our famous clients, perhaps like Kim Davis, the Kentucky County Clerk, or Sandra Merritt, who helped make the undercover uh, videos of Planned Parenthood operatives uh, making deals to sell baby body parts. But most of our clients, uh, you'll probably never heard of, and they are simply faithful Christians who are uh, you know, following God's call to stand firm for their faith uh, at work, at school, uh, or somewhere where they're getting a hard time for it. And uh, we are uh, privileged to represent these true heroes of the faith uh, who just simply want to, uh, to live their lives uh, according to uh, according to scripture and live their lives obediently to God. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, two Supreme Court cases dealing with federal non-discrimination law. They were just decided uh, this summer, one in June and one in July. Uh, the first case is the Bostic case, uh, where the Supreme Court defined the word sex to now include uh, sexual orientation and gender identity in federal non-discrimination cases. And the second case is uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, where the Supreme Court uh, expanded and clarified the exemption available to Christian organizations, uh, churches, uh, Christian schools, uh, and other ministries, uh, exemption for those organizations from the same federal non-discrimination laws uh, under something that we call the ministerial exception. So I'll cover uh, each case and then at the end, uh, open it up for Q&A. Um, so as I said, this case consolidates three employment related cases that was just decided uh, in June. Uh, and it deals with Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You may have heard of this law referred to generally as Title VII, but basically it's the law that says you can't discriminate against people uh, in employment because of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Uh, and I'm going to repeat those categories. Uh, Title VII makes it illegal to discriminate against anyone because of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Now, if we just keep those, uh, those things in mind, um, those categories in mind, you'll see why the decision in Bostick was so surprising to many of us. Um, the issue, as framed by the court, said, Today, we must decide whether an employer can fire someone simply for being homosexual or transgender. The answer is clear. Now, if we stopped right there, we just look back on the Title VII categories that are in the statute itself and have been since 1964, we see race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. The words homo homosexuality or sexual orientation, uh, gender identity or transgender are nowhere to be seen in the statute. So if we stopped it after those first couple sentences of the court opinion, where uh, Justice Gorsuch said the answer is clear, we might have thought the answer was going to be no. Title VII does not uh, cover homosexuality or transgender identity um, in, in discrimination in employment. But then Justice Gorsuch writes this, an employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. And this sentence causes us to say, what's going on here? Um, this doesn't really make any sense. The words homosexuality, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity are nowhere to be found in the statute. And yes, Ju Justice Gorsuch says that it's a form of sex discrimination to fire someone or take employment action against someone 
on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, before we get into his reasoning, let's talk about the facts of the case. Um, three different cases. One was brought by Gerald Bostic, uh, who the case is, is, he's the main name on the case and the name uh, you know, that the case will be known by. Um, he worked for Clayton County, Georgia as a child welfare advocate. Uh, he began participating in a gay recreational softball league, and then he was subsequently fired for conduct unbecoming a county employee. Second, we have Donald Zarda, worked as a skydiving instructor uh, at a place in New York. And after several seasons with the company, he mentioned that he was gay and days later was fired. And then finally, we have Amy Stevens, worked at RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes in Garden City, Michigan. Now, I'm, I'm gonna use, uh, be careful with my pronouns here and you'll see what the issue is. Amy Stevens, when he was hired by the funeral home, presented as a male. But two years into his service with the company, uh, he began treatment for uh, what is ca uh, called gender dysphoria. And in his sixth year with the company, uh, he wrote a letter to his employer explaining that after a vacation, he planned to live and work full time as a woman. And before he came back from vacation, the employer said, uh, no, uh, you, we're not going to have you back. Um, so in each of these three cases, it was, there was no performance issue. Uh, there was no other issue other than uh, the first two, the, the individuals were fired because they identified as homosexual. And in the third case, um, a man wanted to begin living and identifying as a woman, and for that reason was let go. So the, the facts are fairly simple. And again, we go back to the language of the statute and see that, that those categories, homosexuality, gender identity, are not covered at all in the statute. Um, but here's the reasoning from Justice Gorsuch. He says that the court normally interprets a statute in accord with the ordinary public meaning of its terms at the time of its enactment. Now, I think we can all agree, and even the Supreme Court justices would agree, in 1964, no one thought the word sex, as used in the non-discrimination law, would have covered uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. It wasn't on anyone's mind in Congress uh, when the law was passed. Um, however, Justice Gorsuch says that it still covers those categories because, and he uses this example, consider, for example, an employer with two employees, both of whom are attracted to men. One is a man and the other a woman. If the employer fires the male employee for no reason other than the fact that he is attracted to men, the employer discriminates against him for traits or actions it tolerates in his female colleague because the employer would not fire her for being attracted to a man. So you see here, there's a very basic kind of elementary uh, logic here where Justice Gorsuch says, if you have two employees where one's a man and one's a woman, and they're both attracted to men, you can't fire the man for being attracted to men if you wouldn't also fire the woman for being attracted to men. And so in his view, that means that you're discriminating on the basis of the sex of the employee. And again, there, there is a, a kind of a basic logic to that. But the problem is, is that basic logic isn't really a, a a way or an approach for interpreting laws. Um, we've heard of the, the concept of textualism or originalism that was championed by the late Justice Scalia. Uh, and that's what Gorsuch sort of said he was doing here. He was just paying attention to what the law said uh, and what the ordinary meaning of the word sex was in 1964 when the law was passed. Um, but the problem was is we don't look at statutes always just in terms of individual words. We look at phrases. And the idea of someone being fired or having adverse employment action taken against a, a person because of sex would not in anyone's mind have, have brought the idea of because that person identified as homosexual or because that person identified as the other sex. Um, those things just weren't part of the ordinary understanding of discrimination because of sex in 1964. And it was very, uh, that point was made over and over again in the dissents. Um, in fact, there was one filed by Justice Alito, uh, and he said this, there is only one word for what the court has done today, legislation. Uh, in other words, Justice Gorsuch joined by five other justices 
um, made up a new law. They made up a new term or new terms to fit within Title VII that were not there before and fit it in uh, under this idea of discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, but this is going to have now a, a ripple effect because that word sex is used in lots of non-discrimination laws, both at the federal and the state and also at the local level. Uh, for example, Title IX, dealing with uh, funding and sports programs uh, at, at colleges and universities. Um, lots of state and local non-discrimination laws also use the term sex. Uh, they prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex. And up to now, we all thought we knew what that meant. But because of this Supreme Court decision, all of these uh, provisions, all these laws and ordinances are going to be reinterpreted to make sex mean also homosexuality or a gender identity. Um, now there is a, you know, the first question that might come to mind is, well, what about churches and Christian organizations and even individual Christians in the marketplace who are employers or employees of uh, secular businesses? Um, how is this going to affect them? Um, well, Justice uh, Gorsuch, in his majority opinion, uh, he began to address the issue, but then saved it for a future case. Uh, he says, we're deeply concerned with preserving the promise of the free exercise of religion enshrined in our constitution. Uh, and so Congress, for one, included an express exception in Title VII itself. But if we look at that, it's very specific. What uh, Title VII's uh, exception says is that it doesn't apply to a college, university, or other educational institution that is religious to, that wants to hire or fire an employee based on that employee being a member of the same religion. Um, that's a pretty specific uh, exemption. It only applies to colleges, universities, Christian schools. Uh, and it seems to only apply, for example, if it's a Baptist institution, uh, you can hire and fire based on the person being Baptist. Uh, if it's a Presbyterian institution, you can hire and fire on the basis of the person being Presbyterian. Now, we can take a broader view of that and say what it really means is that if you're a Christian institution, you can hire and fire based on the uh, someone being a Christian. Um, but that raises the question of who gets to decide whether the person is Christian enough to keep their job or, or not have a job there, um, or what the differences between the denominations means in the context of that exemption. Um, and so that exemption creates some problems and it doesn't answer the whole question. What about churches that are not colleges or universities, just you know, your garden variety local churches? Uh, what about other Christian ministries that feed the poor or Christian ministries that, uh, that do other things besides you know, educate like a college or a university does? What about them? There is no exemption for them in, in Title VII. So that's a question that I'm gonna answer a little, uh, go a little deeper with that in the second case that we're going to discuss. Um, but I just want to conclude here with the Bostic case and, uh, and say that um, the, the majority opinion said that we recognize there are going to be religious liberty issues, but those issues are not in front of us today, and so we don't have to answer those questions today. Um, and that is, a, on one hand, encouraging because Justice Gorsuch went out of his way to recognize the issue, but it's discouraging because we don't know. It leaves now uh, a lot of uncertainty in how this law is going to be applied uh, to uh, religious institutions and particularly religious uh, persons. Um, if we look now uh, across the country, uh, there were about 23 states that did not have any kind of sexual orientation or gender identity or SOGI non-discrimination law on the books. Um, Florida, for example, is one of those states that has no statewide SOGI law. But within Florida, lots of cities and counties do have such a law. Um, this Bostic decision may perhaps make those laws obsolete because it just imports the concepts of sexual orientation and gender identity into the word sex, which is in all of the non-discrimination laws that you'll find. So one effect may be sort of null not really nullifying, but making obsolete these separate sexual orientation, gender identity laws that have been passed around the country and in lots of municipalities uh, within the state of Florida. Um, but we, uh, we also see the, the individual Christian who is trying to, uh, to maintain faith in, uh, in employment, uh, either as an employee, uh, wanting to be a faithful witness, uh, uh, or just simply be able to 
uh, to defend uh, their faith uh, when, uh, when confronted or asked about it. Um, and also Christian employers who have secular businesses who want to apply Christian principles and how they run their business. For example, the photographers and cake decorators and, and, and professions that involve creative uh, ability and they're being asked to apply those creative abilities to same-sex marriages. Uh, we've seen several of those cases work their way through the courts, um, and the Supreme Court hasn't quite answered that question yet. So this new, this Title VII decision in Bostick, um, it, it represents a sea change in non-discrimination law by all of a sudden foisting upon us the, the concepts of homosexuality or, or sexual orientation and gender identity as being automatically covered in non-discrimination law. Uh, and we're going to have to deal with that. Now, the next case is Our Lady of Guadalupe School versus Morrissey Beru. Um, this case consolidates two cases coming out of California involving uh, Catholic elementary school teachers. Um, in both cases, you had an elementary school teacher employed by a Catholic school uh, who was fired and in both cases, the teacher sued for discrimination. On one of them sued for discrimination on the basis of age, and the other sued for discrimination on the basis of disability. Uh, she was a breast cancer patient uh, undergoing treatment. Um, in this case, the, uh, the issue was frame, as framed by uh, Justice Alito, who wrote the majority opinion. Uh, he says, these cases require us to decide whether the First Amendment permits courts to intervene in employment disputes involving teachers at religious schools who are entrusted with the responsibility of instructing their students in the faith. The First Amendment protects the right of religious institutions to decide for themselves, free from state interference, matters of church government as well as those of faith and doctrine. Now, unlike the Bostic case that we just discussed, here in Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, we see an encouraging statement right up front. Justice Alito affirms the longstanding principle that the government has no business meddling in church affairs. Uh, and apparently that means as well in the hiring and firing decisions of a Catholic school. Um, this decision uh, expanded and clarified what has become known as the ministerial exception to non-discrimination laws. Uh, we're still dealing with the same Title VII that we were dealing with in the Bostic case. Um, but here we have it being applied not based on discrimination on the basis of sex or sexual orientation or gender identity. Here we have uh, the application to age discrimination and the application to uh, disability discrimination. Um, and in both cases, the, the schools that fired these employees said, well, we didn't discriminate on, for any of those reasons. They just weren't doing a good job. Uh, and by the way, under Supreme Court precedent, we are immune from a lawsuit based on discrimination because we are a, a religious entity and these employees are, uh, are important to the religious mission of our institutions. Um, let's look at the facts here to, to understand what they're talking about. Um, both teachers were required to teach religion, uh, to integrate, integrate religious thought into secular subjects. They were required to pray with students. They were required to attend mass with students. They were uh, required to model the, the faith life, to model the Catholic faith in, in word and in deed, uh, and they were required to exemplify the teachings of Christ. Uh, in other words, as, as school teachers responsible for providing instruction on all subjects to their students, uh, including religion, um, they were the members of the school staff who had the most direct impact and the most direct responsibility for carrying out the religious mission of that school. Um, they were expected to live Catholic lives in addition to teaching Catholic subjects. Uh, I actually grew up in Catholic schools and we literally had one subject a day was called religion. And that was the, the class where we got direct religious instruction. But if we had questions in science class or in English class or in math class that, um, that went into uh, you know, issues of creation or issues of theology, our teachers were expected to answer those questions as well and to answer them in a way that is faithful and consistent with the, uh, the beliefs of the school. So um, here the Supreme Court um, in a seven to two decision, it actually even a bigger majority than the, than the prior decision we discussed, agreed that when you're talking about a Catholic school 
um, the teachers are an important part of the religious mission of that school. And therefore, the government can't interfere in the hiring and firing decisions. Uh, and what's important is, even if the hiring and firing decision didn't have anything to do with matters of faith, or religion or anything like that. These were garden variety, uh, as, as a lawyer, I'll say garden variety discrimination cases based on age or based on disability. Um, so the, the test that came out of this, uh, we used to call it the ministerial exception because in other cases, having the title of minister was important. Um, that indicated to the court that this person had a specific religious responsibility for the institution or the organization. But what the court said in the, uh, the Our Lady of Guadalupe case is, is that the title doesn't matter. What really matters is what does the employee do? Uh, and if we can distill any kind of useful test out of this case, uh, I think it would be that uh, if the employee plays a vital part in carrying out the religious mission of the employer, um, then that employee uh, is subject to this ministerial exception. Um, or in a nod to the late musician Prince, uh, I heard one lawyer call it the doctrine formerly known as the ministerial exception. And that's because we, the title of minister doesn't matter anymore, but we'll still call it the ministerial exception. And this case um, made it very broad. Uh, I think it's useful though to talk about some, some applications because these, these cases were decided in the context of a, of a Catholic school. Um, it's easy to then analogize to, to Protestant schools and in any religious schools, whether they be Christian, Jewish, uh, Muslim, uh, across the board. If you have uh, teachers who are entrusted with carrying out the religious mission of the institution, they probably fall under this ministerial exception and therefore wouldn't be able to, uh, to avail themselves of federal non-discrimination laws uh, if fired. Um, now, I'll take a step back here and say that it by no means would, uh, would us as a, would we as a Christian organization, or do I think any Christians would uh, condone firing people for improper reasons, whether it's because of their age or a disability um, or because of their sex, uh, unless those categories had something to do with the uh, religious mission of the institution. Um, but uh, it's important here to note that the, the government is saying, we're not going to inquire any further once, you, once the church or the institution identifies that this person is a vital part of the religious mission of the organization, um, then we're just going to say that they're exempt from that law and we're not going to inquire further. Um, so for example, say you have a, um, a science teacher who's asked, you know, how does the fossil record square with the biblical creation account? Uh, you would expect as a religious employer that that science teacher to give a, a biblically literate uh, answer and one that's consistent with whatever the faith distinctives of the institution are. Um, or an English teacher uh, asked a question about the novel Frankenstein. Uh, does God's mandate in Genesis to take dominion over creation include attempting to create life from dead body parts? Uh, would such a creation be God's image bearer? You would want your English teacher in a Christian school to have a uh, a biblical answer for that question um, and to be prepared to, to provide an answer that is consistent with the, uh, the statement of faith or the faith distinctives of that organization. Um, where it gets a little bit harder is in the, going back to the, the Christian elementary school example, um, what if you have a cafeteria worker on the food line and you know, a student may ask, uh, you know, did God provide this food to us or, or did you buy it? Um, how would you expect your cafeteria worker to answer that question? Um, or to a, a custodian who the students get to know well because they, they see him you know, every day. Um, you know, can you take out the trash to the glory of God? Do you expect your custodial staff to have an answer, a biblical answer to, to that question? Um, or do you train them to say something like, well, you should ask your teacher or ask your parents? Um, if you view every employee of your institution as being vital to the mission, uh, to being vital to that Christian community, um, then that employee can be considered a, a minister under the ministerial exception in the sense that that person is a vital part of the religious mission of the, uh, of the institution. Um, but when you're talking about food service workers or custodial staff, people who aren't in your traditional sort of ministerial roles, um, it's vitally important for the Christian organization to document that 
it views all employees, including those employees, as, uh, as vital to the religious mission of the institution. Um, and it's also important that the, uh, that the institution, uh, say it's a school, you know, monitor and make that part of the evaluation of those employees so that there's always a uh, documentation that, that they take this seriously. It's not just a, a statement up front that everyone's a part of the mission, uh, but it's something that the school actually holds all its employees accountable for and, and monitors that on an ongoing basis. Uh, again, what's important is what the employee does um, and the way to prove what the employee does is to have good documentation of it. Um, there was a case a while back in the Northeast where a, a state court ruled that, a, that the, man, the food service manager at a Catholic school was not uh, subject to this ministerial exception because the court decided that that food service worker was not a vital part of the, the religious mission of the school, even though the school said the person was. Um, after this Our Lady of Guadalupe case, at least as far as the federal constitution, the First Amendment is concerned, um, it basically becomes a matter of taking the church's word for it. And, and if you're going to challenge it, uh, if, if you are a church that's challenged or you're a, a religious institution that's challenged, you wanna have good documentation that you take the matter seriously and treating all of your employees as, as vital members of the mission. Now, it may be that you don't treat everyone as vital members of the mission. And of course, that's your prerogative as a, as a Christian institution as well. Um, you can make distinctions as to which employees are vital to the religious mission and which employees are not. Um, but you wanna, again, document that and be consistent in how you treat those employees um, and understand that if you, uh, if you don't treat an employee as, as being vital to the religious mission, that employee has the full, um, the full menu of non-discrimination protections available to them, uh, such as age, race, uh, disability, uh, et cetera. Um, so the, uh, a few other issues that came out of, uh, out of this court decision um, was the, the issue, they noted that the, one of the plaintiffs, one of the teachers who was fired said she was no longer a practicing Catholic. Uh, and she said that made a difference because referring back to that uh, exception that I mentioned earlier where uh, this Title VII statute says you can make hiring and firing decisions based on whether that person is or is not a member of the same religion. Um, and she tried to, to create, to, to find some space uh, in the Our Lady of Guadalupe decision by saying, well, I wasn't a practicing Catholic, so those things don't apply to me. I'm subject to just regular non-discrimination law. And what the, uh, the Supreme Court said, I think very uh, wisely, is look, we're not going to be uh, getting involved in deciding whether someone's a practicing Catholic uh, or whether uh, you know, a Presbyterian is close enough to a Baptist or whether a, you know, a Southern Baptist and a Primitive Baptist are the same thing. Um, the court doesn't want anything to do with trying to make those distinctions. And so again, it comes down to what the employee does, not what the employee's title is. Uh, and as the institution or as the employer, uh, it's important to document these things uh, very well. Uh, so that, um, so if you are ever put to the proof, you'll be able to, to do that. Um, so putting these cases together, um, the, the Bostic case that says sex discrimination means sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as sex, uh, and the Our Lady of Guadalupe case that, that, that clarifies and, and I think expands this broad ministerial exception for religious institutions, um, I think what we have is, is good and bad news. It's, it's good news for churches, Christian colleges and universities and schools and Christian ministries. Um, they are likely not affected directly today by the Bostic decision that imports sexual orientation, gender identity into the definition of sex. Um, but beyond those institutions, for your, uh, your faithful Christians out in the marketplace, uh, there's still a really big question mark about how this case is going to affect them. For example, an employer who wants to enforce a dress code um, uh, for men and for women, um, an employer who wants to have sex segregated facilities, for example, a men's bathroom and a woman's bathroom, uh, sports uh, at the college level where Title IX applies, uh, where already we're seeing uh, sort of a minor uh, revolution where, where mainly girls who are tired of losing to biological boys are starting to say that's enough. Um, we don't think this is fair. Um, all of these questions are still open, 
uh, after the Bostic decision and will be the, the subject of, of future litigation, uh, undoubtedly. Um, Liberty Council, as just one organization, will, uh, will certainly get involved in that kind of litigation. Uh, and there are others out there like us who are going to do the same thing. Um, so for those of you who are, who are pastors, uh, professors uh, in Christian leadership, where you have an audience or where you have um, other Christians who you are discipling or investing into them, um, my advice, for, first of all, is to, um, is to you know, help, them, um, help them grow in their faith just through the, the ministry of the word, um, because that more than anything will, will, uh, will steal them, will embolden them, will give them the courage to, to maintain their faith in the face of these challenges that are on the horizon. Um, that, is, that is the number one thing I think you can do. Uh, is just to keep discipling them through the ministry of, of the word. Uh, the second thing is to, if, if you find uh, you have someone who, who is in trouble, uh, who's been confronted or accused of discrimination on one of these bases, um, refer them to an organization like Liberty Council. We represent all of our clients free of charge. And uh, it is a privilege and honor for us to represent faithful Christians and Christian institutions uh, that are trying to to simply freely exercise their, their faith distinctives uh, and find themselves in legal trouble for it. Um, and it, with that, I'd like to you know, spend the rest of our time uh, just in conversation and maybe open it up uh, for, uh, for questions. Um, well, it's funny you should say that because a new guy that I'm gonna have come on the board, um, he, filled, he already filled out an application. I think she doesn't realize she's not muted. <laughs> Does, does someone uh, have a question? I put one in the box if you wanna. <laughs> okay, um, and this is, is it Leanne? Yes. Okay, um, so the question is, don't you think we should have ministry exception? Um, courts have a peremptory challenge in Board Dyer and they can exempt people based on discretion. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's a, uh, that's a great question. If, if I understand the question correctly, uh, for example, when we're picking a jury, um, each lawyer gets a certain number of peremptory challenges where they can disqualify a juror without giving a reason. Um, and the idea is that they won't, of course, have any bad reasons for doing that, but the court isn't going to ask them. Um, and so should we have a ministry exception for hiring and firing and things like that? Um, and and I, think, I think the answer is yes. And I think that's largely what the Our Lady of Guadalupe decision accomplishes. If, if you are a Christian ministry, um, at least to the extent you can show this person is vital to the religious mission. Um, one thing we have to be careful of is that, uh, you know, I've, in, in the circles that I've been trained in and the people I've read, um, the idea of, of Jesus being Lord over every sphere of life uh, is common language. And, and I understand that. And I can look at, you know, anything I do and, and say it's for the glory of God and, and I owe that to God. Um, People who are not believers, they don't see the world that way. Um, we're seeing this in our uh, cases where we're litigating for churches to reopen. There's a lot of judges who just don't understand what the big deal is, why uh, worship by Zoom call or YouTube video isn't just as good as being assembled together for in-person worship. Um, so the unbelieving world doesn't see, doesn't understand that we as Christians um, you know, give everything to Christ. And we don't have any trouble seeing even the, uh, the entry-level employee who doesn't seemingly have any, uh, any responsibility to disciple someone or to, to be a, a teacher of the faith is nonetheless vital to the entire mission of the organization. So that's why it's important to document as much as you can so that if you find yourself in front of a judge who doesn't get it or in front of a jury that doesn't get it, they will see that you're serious about it and that you did everything you could um, to treat this person as if they were uh, important to, uh, to the mission. So I think that that kind of ministry exception does exist to a point. Um, it doesn't exist quite so far as, as, uh, as no questions will ever be asked uh, when, a, when a church uh, fires someone or doesn't give someone a raise or promotes someone or something like that. Um, but it is stronger than it has been at least understood in the past. And, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I think the First Amendment probably contemplated even going so far as Leanne uh, suggested that 
that literally the court should ask no questions at all. But uh, I don't think we're quite there, uh, even with, uh, with this court decision. Uh, I just realized that I never shared with you the link uh, to the second case, to the uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe case. I'm going to post our uh, Liberty Council press release and the opinion link in the comments for anyone who's interested in those. Um, I think we had a path of it. I don't know what you want to. Yes, is that another question? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Dale. Um, hey, Roger, I, you were talking about Gorsuch, and I guess you were paraphrasing about saying he wasn't going to decide who was Christian enough. And so it made me wonder, you know, if institutions have the right to define their own <laughs> beliefs with you know, how much that, you know, uh, theological beliefs versus a total world and life view. And the second case seems to answer that a little bit, but I was wondering, um, does a, a, an institution an organization that's not educational or religious, uh, you know, a bake, a bake bakery or a florist, I mean, do they have the right to say are as well? Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think, I as I understand the question, does the does the Christian baker uh, or photographer um, or you know county clerk, for example, um, have the right to say, you know, I want to live out my faith uh, in in my work and in all of my life, uh, and the government has to leave me alone when I do that. Um, and the answer is, we we don't know yet how far that's going to go. The, the encouraging sign was in the master, Masterpiece Cake Shop case uh, that arose out of Colorado, where there you have Jack Phillips, who is a baker. He um, gladly sells everything in his store to any customer. Uh, he has had employees who identified as homosexual. He certainly has sold baked goods to people who identify as homosexual, uh, probably not knowing one way or the other because he never asked. But when he was asked to apply his artistic talent to decorate a wedding cake for a same-sex wedding, he said, look, I don't discriminate against people, but there's some events that my faith will not allow me to participate in. Uh, in other words, uh, my creative talent to, to design a beautiful cake, to celebrate an occasion, um, is given to me my God, and I cannot use that to promote or to, to beautify something that goes against my faith. Um, the state of Colorado came down hard on him and said that that was violating their non-discrimination law. And that case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. But rather than answering the question of whether he was free to do that, what the court found is that he was mistreated in the process by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission because they made several comments during the course of their deliberations that basically you know, made fun of or criticized his faith. And the Supreme Court said, we're not allowed to do that. The First Amendment doesn't permit the government to show hostility towards someone's faith. And so the Supreme Court sent it back to Colorado to sort of do a do-over. Now, that wasn't very satisfying because what we wanted them to say was, as a Christian, he had the absolute right to decline to participate in something that would violate his conscience. Uh, the court didn't say that. It only went so far as to say the government can't show hostility to his beliefs. Um, we don't know yet how the second part of that story, uh, we don't know how that's going to end. But I would say, yes, I think Christians have that right under the Constitution um, and certainly should be able to, to exercise their faith uh, in their work and in all that they do without being uh, punished by the government. I think we live in a society that, that sort of gets this. And you know, I think the vast majority of same-sex couples that want a cake, they want it from someone who wants to do it and are willing to, to shop around and find the baker that, that matches up with them. But because there's some who want to make an issue out of it, uh, you're going to have Christians constantly in fear and sort of self-censoring uh, their own beliefs. Um, I've seen this lots of times when um, we would find a we'd have a jurisdiction where a law gets passed and we're looking for plaintiffs, someone willing to, to be the, the person to challenge the law. We would represent them free of charge. And what many of them say is, look, I just don't want the publicity. I don't want all of that comes along with that. And so we're going to kind of self-censor. We're going to just go along 
to avoid litigation or maybe get out of doing wedding cakes altogether so that they're not forced to violate their conscience. So I think we see a lot of that. And until the Supreme Court says definitively that, that that's a right that we have, uh, it's still going to be an open question. Um, and I, I think that um, we're only going to get challengers like Jack Phillips in Colorado, like I said earlier, if if that person is is at a church where they're hearing the word preached and being equipped on a weekly basis uh, to just stand firm uh, for what they believe in. Um, uh, we when uh, we represented Kim Davis, who was, who was sued, and we're still litigating her case, uh, she didn't want to issue a marriage license to a same-sex couple. Um, she, she decided well before she was ever asked to issue this marriage license that she was going to be faithful. You know, she made up her mind very early on so that when she was challenged, uh, she was ready for it. Um, so equipping your, your constituents to not wait until the challenge comes to decide if they're ready for it. Uh, is really important. Um, you want it to be an easy decision for them because they've been uh, equipped. Uh, I, hope, I hope that answers the, the question, Neil. Uh, what else is out there um, as far as questions about these cases? Hi there. I have a question. Yes, Tony, is it? Yes, sir. When during, like during the hiring process, is there anything that we could do in our constitution or bylaws that would help protect us in any way so we can avoid some of that stuff down the road? That's an excellent question. Uh, and in fact, we advise uh, churches and organizations to, to do a review of their governing documents, uh, whether you know, it's your articles of incorporation uh, or you know, your, your, uh, your operating agreement, whatever entity kind of entity you have whatever your your definitive governing document is and in, in an incorporation you're going to have your articles of incorporation and you're going to have bylaws uh, it's better to do it in the articles because that's sort of the the constitution of the organization and what you want it to contain is a clear statement of whatever faith distinctives you are going to operate your organization under it might be something as simple as the, something like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed that lays out the, the basics, sort of the basic doctrines of Christian belief. But I think you should go farther and, and make it clear that uh, you, as, you, know, you ascribe to, to biblical marriage. In other words, you know, we recognize marriage as the union of one man and one woman, and all you know, sexual unions outside of that relationship we consider sinful. Um, you don't have to take a stand against homosexuality or against transgenderism per se, um, but you should make it clear what we do stand for, and that's you know, biblical um, marriage, uh, the biblical concept of being created male and female, and that that's, you know, that's all there is, um, things like that, so that if you are challenged, you can say, no, it, it's, it's right here in our governing documents that this is what we believe. Um, and hopefully you've been consistent with that in the actions that you've taken and the things that you've said. Um, it can be difficult if you have been lax about it or um, you let it slide for a good employee uh, because you didn't want to lose them, even though right. they were doing something that wasn't you know, necessarily in line with your statement of faith. So, um, but I, that's a great question. And we do recommend that you, you do a review. Uh, you know, anyone who participates in this call you know, uh, can get in contact with me uh, through, the, uh, through the college. Uh, we have some model language that we can supply to you. Uh, I, when I started working here, I, I joined a new church here in Central Florida, and I, I helped them do the, this exact thing, I kind of go through the governing documents and make sure it's clear what we believe in so that if, if we're ever challenged, um, we would have that additional evidence. Uh, and hopefully you don't ever need it, but, um, you know, but it's always good to have it. Oh, thank you. Any other questions about the uh, the application of these cases to to your organizations or uh, to uh, to Christians in the marketplace? Can I just uh, clarify something? I have clients, uh, Christian organizations, and if my mic isn't working, that's why I haven't been talking much. I can so, hear you. you. Okay, I'm not sure. 
um, I have clients who are Christian organizations and, and they are concerned after reading some of these opinions whether they could hire a receptionist, whether they could hire someone um, to do, you know, just some general tasks that have nothing to do with, um, uh, you know, interacting with, say, the constituents or the recipients of whatever their ministry is or whatever it is that they do. Uh, so they would not be typically the person uh, that the recipients or constituents would be asking religious questions of. But these organizations do want to hire Christians. They do want to hire people that are of like faith and sit and do prayer with everybody. And you, you know what that's like in right. an organization. So how, if at all, do these recent opinions affect the hiring of those people? That's a good question. Um, and when we're talking specifically about religious institutions that get this broad exception under the Our Lady of Guadalupe case, um, it's really, you can customize your, your hiring practices for however fits your, the mission of your organization. Uh, for example, um, uh, an organization that, uh, that houses the homeless or maybe is a sort of a, a mission organization to help people uh, you know, get off the street or recover from, from drug abuse, um, they might find that there's a position uh, that would match the skills of someone that they're ministering to, but that person hasn't uh, accepted Christ yet, or maybe that person um, comes from a, a different, you know, faith background and it's still a work in progress. But you want to extend employment to this person because you want to put their skills to work, and and you're not expecting that person to teach doctrine or or to necessarily be the spokesperson for the company. Um, you can do that. Um, what you should do, though, is just make sure that the job description for that position um, either does or does not include uh, those faith distinctives that, that you find important. Um, I'll give you an example uh, uh, something like this. Uh, we've done some work with Liberty University, and uh, in looking at their employment manual, they have a different set of requirements for professors uh, outside of the theology or divinity departments than they do for those professors within those departments. So in other words, Liberty has certain faith distinctives that it wants to instill in its divinity students and in its theology students um, that get very specific about certain, uh, you know, end times doctrine or maybe baptism or, or things that, that, you know, that we recognize can be different uh, across uh, uh, Christian denominations, but they don't require uh, their, you know, their science professors or their math professors or their literature professors necessarily to ascribe to those specific doctrinal issues that they're teaching to their divinity students. And so you can have sort of a different standards for different people that the key is to have it documented well and to be consistent about it so that um, if you, if it says that your receptionist, um, you know, must ascribe to the Apostles Creed and, uh, and believers baptism only. And, you know, that receptionist uh, promotes, you know, infant baptism to other employees, and you don't do anything about it, um, then you're sort of giving up the ability to, to make employment decisions based on those distinctives if you never enforce them. You know, that might be sort of a crude example, but um, it's perfectly okay uh, for the organization to define for each position uh, what the expectations are in terms of what role that person plays in the religious mission of the organization. Um, and the key, and, and I'll, I'll say this over and over again because it's the lawyer in me, just document it and, and be consistent in how you apply it. Um, those are the uh, important things to do. So other than, let's say if it's a, a church or a school that has actual teachers of doctrine, other than those employees, is it okay to have a blanket statement in every uh, um, job description for every person in every way <laughs> um, in an organization that says this job description must describe to the statement of faith of this organization and then it's up to you what that contains and and all that sort of thing yeah yeah i mean the way i see it done is you know 
your articles of incorporation, whatever your governing documents are, will say, you know, this is what we believe. And then uh, when you hire someone, you ask that employee to, you give that employee a copy of it, you ask them to read it, and you ask them to sign something saying, I've read it and agree to, you know, be bound by this. Um, and even there, you can you can take a different approaches. You can you can either require the employee to just agree or acknowledge that they've read it and they understand that this is what the organization stands for, or you can ask that employee to actually affirm that the employee believes those things. Um, again, you have that freedom uh, under. You know, I think you already had it, uh, but that it's been made clear in this this new decision. Um, whatever is important to the mission of the organization, you get to define those standards. So, um, so you can say, look, we, this is what we believe. We don't want you ever, you know, contradicting it to our customers or our constituents or, or other employees, but we don't necessarily require you to believe these things. You know, that's your prerogative to, to set that as the standard. Or you could say, look, it's so important within what the, in the work that we're doing that we're all on the same page and what we believe. Therefore, you must actually agree that you believe these things in order to work here. Um, and then, you know, you've set the standard that the person will be evaluated by down the road. Uh, I wanted to point out, uh, if, if while anyone's thinking of any, any final questions, something that I thought was, was interesting. I, I mentioned the judges that you might run into in a court case who, um, who don't get it. Um, I'm thankful that, uh, that Justice Alito, uh, in writing his, his uh, opinion in the Our Lady of Guadalupe case, he is a judge who does get it. Throughout the opinion, when you read it, you see that he gets, he understands this idea of, of the, you know, the, the faith practices of the organization being important throughout the organization. Um, and something that he, uh, he pointed out was, uh, a core belief of the Puritans was that education was essential to thwart the chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures. Thus, in 1647, the Massachusetts General Court passed what has been called the Old Deluder Satan Act, requiring every sizable town to establish a school. Um, just seeing that statement, it, it caused me to sort of be a little nostalgic, uh, even though that was obviously well before my time, but for a time when uh, when even in our government, we could recognize uh, what we're up against here and that the, the purpose of, of education you know, to the Christian um, is, to, uh, is to train, uh, train up uh, children and, and train up adults even as disciples uh, in the instruction of the Lord and that our enemy is the devil, uh, the old deluder Satan, uh, that, that that is the enemy that we're up against. And, and Justice Alito didn't have to include that in his opinion, uh, but he did. And it's a good reminder that uh, then all that we're doing here um, in these legal cases that, that you may find yourself running into, um, we know who the real enemy is. And, uh, and you know, it's not the flesh and blood often who's suing you or, uh, or who is uh, who's giving you a hard time, but, uh, but it's, it's the devil himself. And um, keeping that in mind uh, helps keep in perspective um, you know, what's at stake and, and, and why we need to be so uh, consistent and, and firm in our, in our witness here. Um, other questions before? Uh, before yes. We Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so sorry I got on here late. Um, I would love to get the recording emailed to me if it's possible. And I have a question. I don't know if it was answered already, but um, sure. if an applicant, uh, can they, do they have to reveal um, their belief to me before I even go into the hiring process? That's a great question. Um, as a church uh, or as a Christian organization, you can ask. And if, if the person is unwilling, you know, they don't have to tell you, but if they won't tell you, you also don't have to go any further with them. So you can make answering that question a condition of, of participating in the hiring process. So you absolutely have the right to do that. And of course, uh, someone may have, a reason to not want to tell you, and that's okay for them. Um, but you don't have to continue in the process with them after that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And welcome. Glad to have you. Um, people, uh, Roger, we're going to try to make the uh, recording available, Pastor Henry. So you'll get an email from me or 
someone at the school that will say, hey, the, here's how you go to the recording. Um, uh, our friend here, Roger, has, has allowed us to do that. So, awesome. um, yeah, so we'll, we'll do the best we can for you on that. Thank you. You know, I'm going to type my email address into the into the chat line so that um, you know if anyone has any follow up questions uh, they want to get in touch with me directly, feel free. Um, I just put it in there. It's it's r g a n n a m at lc dot org and um, lc dot org is also our web address for Liberty Council. If anyone has wants to look at what we do, as I said, we we never charge our clients for our work. We are 100% uh, donor funded, and so. Um, you know, if, uh, if you have any questions about our ministry or, or want to pray for us, uh, we welcome any and all support and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you today. And uh, hopefully um, I could be a resource for you uh, going down the road if you run into any of these issues. Pardon me, Roger. Uh, Jermil Aguinar on the chat asked, I would like to know some of the things we cannot ask during a hiring process. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think, again, to, to make the distinction between a, a Christian organization uh, generally is free to ask, you know, whatever it wants uh, because um, you're simply exempt from uh, the, the federal non-discrimination law at issue here. Um, even if the question doesn't have anything to do with the religious mission, um, if that position that you're hiring is vital to the religious mission of the organization, you can basically ask anything you want. You could, you know, for example, and I'm not recommending this, you could ask someone, you know, how old they are. Uh, you could ask the person, uh, you know, uh, if the person is married, you can ask the person, um, if, uh, you know, if it's a, a woman, for example, you can ask how many children she has. I don't recommend these things, but these are, these are questions that would trigger non-discrimination laws uh, outside the religious entity context. But you can ask them if they are, um, uh, you know, if you, if you feel led to ask them for a reason, you know, for, because it has something to do with the, uh, the mission or, or with the position. But uh, again, it's, it's the position you're hiring for is what gets the exemption based on that uh, position being vital to the religious mission of the organization. Um, and as long as it's one of those positions that's covered, uh, and, and as we've discussed today, that would be, that could be most, if not all, in any particular organization, uh, you're kind of free to ask whatever, whatever questions you want. Outside of that context, if you're not a religious organization, uh, if you're a secular employer, for example, um, then you can't ask any question that would, uh, that, would result in discrimination on the basis of race, sex, national origin, religion, uh, et cetera. Um, just asking those questions can trigger a, a discrimination claim. And so there's, uh, you know, in, in, in secular hiring practices, there are lots of uh, guides for all the things that you're not allowed to ask in an interview. And uh, the list is pretty long, as you might imagine. Do you guys have a white paper or anything that kind of explains to um, industry leaders, do not ask these questions? <laughs> Here's just some samples of do not ask these questions. Um, we don't, Liberty Council doesn't put out anything like that. Um, I think if you go to, for example, the, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission website, um, you will find lots of guidances on uh, prohibited and acceptable employment practices. Um, that's just one example of a resource. Um, lots of commercial law firms actually put out great white papers on this stuff. If you wanna sit down with Google and uh, just spend a few minutes, um, there's a lot of really good information out there, a lot of guides and, uh, and for, you know, for secular employers, non-religious employers, um, a lot of free information. Um, in, a, in, a, in my former life, I litigated a lot of, uh, of employment type disputes, non-compete agreements, and, and things like that. And um, 
sometimes instead of starting with legal research on, on one of the legal databases, I just started with Google. And it's amazing how much free information is out there uh, if you just have one, spend a few minutes to look at it. Well, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I will give the floor back to uh, uh, or Dr. Drabeck. I'm not sure who's closing us out today, but uh, thanks again. I uh, really enjoyed being with you all today and, uh, and look forward to uh, maybe meeting some of you in, in person one day when we're beyond all of this uh, craziness of, of COVID-19. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roger. Um, what a blessing you are, you know, to the body of Christ, to us, all the wonderful information. Uh, you know, he does this, <laughs> he, he does this as ministry, and uh, we, we thank you for it. You know, thank you for your heart for ministry. Thank you for your heart, uh, you know, our, your dedication to the body of Christ, but most importantly, you know, your dedication to God and, and to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So thank you for that. Um, Dolores, um, would you like to close this out maybe in prayer or? Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Father, we thank you so much for providing Roger's gifts and talents to us and his information so that we can carry out or have influence in ministries to carry out what you have charged us to do for your kingdom, Lord. We seek as you have instructed us to keep the civil law as long as it does not cause us to break your law, Father. And so we do want to understand it. We want to be good citizens. We want to do what is right. And yet, Father, we need to be able to, to help people who you are and have an environment where your word prospers and is fostered. So we thank you for all of this. We pray for our nation. We pray for the unrest that is going on in our nation right now. We pray for uh, folks who, who don't feel like everything is fair to them. Nothing's fair to any of us, but some, some it's a lot less. So we do pray for those folks, Father, and we, we ask you to give us answers. Help, us, help guide us to where you know justice and liberty for all means what it says. And I know our founding fathers intended that. Thank you for South Florida Bible College. Thank you for Liberty Council. Thank you for the amazing, devoted uh, folks that are on this uh, Zoom today that just want to serve you, Lord, and lead others to you. We thank you for this time. Thank you for technology, although we haven't mastered this yet. <laughs> we thank you for it in the midst of a, a strange situation. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and it is in your son's mighty name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.